Alright. Hello everybody, welcome back to uh, the stream. Uh, this is in the fur R4 uh, Out School subreddit Discord. Uh, how to Draw the Muzzle is the title of our group study. It's going to be all about creative problem solving. Uh, and I, I will say it's for beginner and intermediate anthro artists. I'll be throwing some information to you about anatomy. I'm going to be throwing some information to you about foreshortening and perspective and reference and proportions. And I'll try and define these terms all along the way to be as helpful to you as possible. Um, I, I will also be drawing on some uh, old material I covered last week's stream. If you missed it, it's fine. You can go back to it. There might be a couple of confusing things in, in this stream if you start out with this one. But if you go back to the one covering anthro heads, uh, that, could, that could possibly help you out uh, a lot uh, in understanding a bit more in depth what I'm going to be doing today. All right. Um, yeah. Oh, um, yeah, I forgot. I wanted to introduce myself on this one. Um, so, uh, I go by Iothisk in the furry fandom. That's with an I, not with an L. A lot of people get confused about that. Totally okay. It's sans serif font's fault. Um, all right. Uh, yeah. Um, so a little bit about my artistic background. I have been drawing anthro art since approximately... 2005, 2006-ish is when I graduated high school. Uh, I went to Broadview Entertainment Arts University and earned my degree in comics and sequential art. Um, yeah, so that's kind of my artistic background. I got a specialization in, in comics, and, and uh, I'm going to teach you a little bit of what I learned today. <laughs> Yes, it's going to be it's going to be fairly simple though, since we're only focusing on one part of the body, or rather of the the animal slash anthro body. It's all going to be pretty easy. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the saturation of my references up just a little, and we're going to look at uh, some of these references. We're going to start with a little bit of a period of observation. Uh, so as as, so when when you're drawing a muzzle, all sorts of animals have muzzles, uh, cats, dogs, all sorts of things. I'm drawing primarily from dog reference because the vast majority of furries are dogs. Uh, it, it's a it's at least 51 percent, I believe. I you know the, it's a it's a fur science. It's science. Look into it. Most furries are canines of some tor type or another, whether that be dogs, foxes, wolves. You, you name it. Most of them are canines. And I think they're followed up by cats and dragons. Yay! My personal favorite. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to be drawing mostly from dogs, but a great amount of what we'll be covering pertains to a lot of different animals. It pertains to drawing in general. So, yeah. All right. So we're going to look kind of like at a muzzle, and if we ask a question well, like, what is a muzzle, then it's just whatever the snoot and mouth is of a furry creature such as this one. So let's notice a couple of things about this. So on the outside, I'm going to switch my layer on the out. Wait, is it not? All right. So, we're going to say that this kind of general area right here, all of this encompasses the muzzle. And so, we've got a top part. And we got a bottom part right there. And we've got the sides that kind of flare out. Uh, and this encompasses, you know, the entirety of the, the nose and mouth. So, on the outside, we have the nose and the lips. And on the nose, we can notice details like the fur pattern. We've got a little bit of a, a pattern going here and down the sides. So we can notice that. And there's going to be some funny asymmetry when it comes to real life animals sometimes. But yeah, so we'll notice the fur pattern. Um, you can go ahead and take notes on this if you want. So like, 
uh, let's see here nose and lips I don't know if it has a different name I've called them chops before they're licking their chops they're licking their chops on the snoot the snoot in the chops uh, so we will notice for a pattern we will notice nose and lip color yeah. which on this wolf are going to be black uh, they sometimes vary as you can tell you know it'll be depending on your reference uh, they'll have whiskers and they'll have like little spots on them too so you can kind of notice all of these different things on muzzles of creatures from the outside they're good details to remember whenever you're drawing so the top part uh, the anatomical term for that is the maxilla and it helps to have names for these things so top top part maxilla that's going to be the top part that's where the nose is that's where the top chops hang over the bottom lips and then we're going to have so that's the maxilla and then the lower part anyone who remembers uh, fairly odd parents maybe this name will be familiar mandible I think that's like boy mandible is his name or something like that I forget what it is but it's like the crimson chin and a sidekick the mandible so the mandible is the lower part of the jaw and then all of this of course is just a big old container for the teeth and the tongue yeah so all of these are are good to remember they're good details like if your if your muzzle looks like it could not contain a teeth and tongue there's definitely something wrong so and um and of course the uh, something that's that's good to cover is the maxilla part is fused with the skull and does not move the mandible is the moving hinge jaw and yeah that about covers the the anatomy of it I don't know every particular technical term for everything so you'll have to forgive me but there's there's a fairly good or overview of that and as you can see we see these parts on uh, a lot of different here's a bone here's a bunch of different breeds of dogs uh, this one's a Pekingese this one's a pug uh, up here let's see here we've got a boxer and a bulldog and all of these dogs are, are very different they have different type of skulls but as you can see they've all got similar features and they've all got muzzles of varying de degrees and so some of them will have that mandible that lower jaw will be curved up especially on the shorter snout ones and a lot of them will come out just at an angle and kind of straight out like that so it's good to notice these things so bring up your references uh, and pay close attention to the proportions of the particular dog breed or whatever that you plan on uh, recreating if you plan on recreating a particular breed if you don't plan on creating a particular breed these can be kind of generalized but yeah since this is all one species canis familiaris all right so yeah keep your references handy um, so for proportions sake we've got a big part uh, we've got the brain case of the cranium so to speak that's here 
we kind of have the brain case of of uh, dogs and canines. And then the brain case will have some type of relationship to the rest of the face. And then for the muzzle particularly, it will be uh, some proportionate ratio to the rest of the face here. So like if I've got, if I'm measuring from here to here approximately, and let's say that this approximately is the end of the muzzle right here, if we divide this into like approximately three parts, we'll get the primary brain case area, the jaw area, and then the, the everything that juts out, so the nose and the lower jaw area out there. And the proportion looks, on this particular skull, roughly one to one. Let's go ahead and look at this real quick. I'm going to pull this out of here. And if I move it over here to the brain case, oh, not quite. Not quite, but it's pretty close. So, you know, um, whenever whenever you're doing stuff like proportions, there'll be things that, like, don't particularly fit. But every time you're taking uh, note of how uh, big something is in comparison to something else, that's what you're doing. You're measuring proportions. So keep those in mind. And again, proportions will change depending on, like... Uh, either the breed of dog or the species of animal. We've got a cat right here. Obviously a cat's got a much, much shorter muzzle than a dog. They got kind of like uh, a sloping, gradual sloping into their muzzle, while the dog has kind of like a, a ski hill where it just kind of goes down and down and outwards, over a hill, down and out. So yeah, good to notice that. Uh, any questions so far? Because if we're all good, I can, good, if we're all good, I can just keep moving. You have one, but I think it'll come up later. Okay, if it doesn't come over, come up later, de make sure to let me know. All right. All right, so we've covered, so we, we bring out our reference. Uh, we've kind of taken note of the proportions. Uh, we understand some of the terms. We have names for the, the different parts of the dog. So like if you're having trouble with particular parts of the muddle, muzzle, you can say, oh, the maxilla, the part that's the top and fused to the skull, or the mandible, the jaw, or whatever. So you know those. Uh, and now we're going to get on to the, to the meat of this. So you're like, how does this all relate? Well, it helps to have names for for everything. So let me go ahead and make a new layer. I'll turn these ones off. I'll turn my references and my text off. All right. So a couple. Let me let me lay down an overview here real quickly. So. foreshortening foreshortening and perspective all right uh, I'm going to cover five uh, ways of thinking about foreshortening and perspective uh, and all of these to kind of summarize all of these all of these are ways to help you visualize rotating something in three dimensions in your head and kind of visualizing uh, the the full thing in your head. Um, not everybody can do that, but the the logic of many of these uh, techniques holds very fast. Uh, and I hope that uh, I hope that one or more of them work for you in helping you to develop uh, the kind of 3D modeling program in your head or your your visualization uh, imagination muscles so to speak. So I'll go ahead and list out these out list all these out first. So feel free to take notes. All right. 
the first one we're going to be covering is overlapping. The second one we will be covering uh, is these are these are kind of principles in general. So this one's got kind of a long title. Sorry. Cylindrical. That's a five cent word there. Cylindrical forms become circular uh, and we'll just kind of abbreviate that to also to contain prismatic forms. And we'll cover what each of these words mean as I get to each one of these, so don't don't get too scared of these, okay? This is just kind of an overview to begin with, so let's get the big words out of the way and we'll, we'll move on. All right. Compression of contours. Revealing new contours. Next one is pivots and ellipses. And then we're going to cover a technique called a technique I like to call linear projection. All right. So that's kind of like an introduction to like all of the terms. Again, don't be scared of these. These all mean very specific things. I'll teach you each one of them. So overlapping uh, is fairly simple. Like, you already know what overlapping is. When one thing overlaps another, that creates an illusion of depth. So say, like, if I've got a string, say it's like a fancy string of pearls or something like that, and we view it from a funny angle, what happens is that we see one overlapping the other because we can't see these other parts, right? overlapping. We can't see this part, but we know it's there. So that this part is overlapping that part. Let me do this. Um, actually, not that way. Let me make this a little bit, a little bit bigger so that it can be a little clearer on the stream if you're watching. That's the wrong tool. Okay. So we've got a string of things like in a row. If we just lay them flat on the table, we're going to see it this way. If we look at them from a below angle and to the side a bit, if so like let's say that our, our eye or our camera or whatever is looking at it from this angle, this is a simulation of kind of what we'd see, these overlapping shapes. So, um, it's, it's, and it's not just overlapping, it's uh, size difference. So, like, we can see, you know, if we look at it from flat on, uh, these are parallel. They're all the same size. These lines right here are never going to intersect. And then if anyone's ever done perspective drawing before, if you've got parallel lines in perspective, they eventually meet at a horizon line vanishing point. So those are both important things to consider overlapping uh, and, uh, and size. So let me put that there. Because the closer to the eye they are, the larger they appear. And the farther from the eye they are, the smaller they appear. And this has to do, if you're wondering why that is, it has to do with the angles 
at which light approaches the eye, right? So a far object is going to have a much narrower angle. So this one's in front is going to be big, and this one in the back is going to be small. So that's why things are different sizes. So there's like a little bit of perspective there. Um, I, I cover this one, for example, so to say like, what if you want to draw like a really toony cartoon character canine of some sort? They've got like a, a ball head. Say they've got like big round cartoon eyes. And they've also got a big snout of some sort. So we can see we've got two forms, one in front of the other, right? And there's kind of a uh, uh, an uh, inferred narrowing between these, for example. So we've got this one, this big old shape, overlapping this smaller head shape. And again, that's not a natural thing. That's a very cartoony, kind of exaggerated thing. That's not how a real dog looks. But this is how this, uh, this, fa this pa principle can work. All right. Um, let me do another example real quick because that one's kind of head on. So let's see if we tried to do the same thing from a three quarters perspective so that I can that I can give you an, an alternate example. So like again if we're looking at it head on kind of like we're looking at the pearls things will kind of flatten but we'll see an overlap, right? And then over here something kind of something kind of similar can happen. Where like if this one, you know, comes out over that for whatever reason it's the cartoon style or whatever. We've got that. Okay, so that's overlapping and size. It's a real principle that will help you lay down uh, sometimes cartoony looking things. As we see, in in reality, the, the opposite will be true when it comes to, to muzzles. But I'll cover that as we, as we go along. So that's overlapping in size. I'm going to go ahead and take all of these and sh shrink them down so they're a bit out of the way. So those are examples of overlapping and size. So we'll just kind of label that one. Uh, that's the wrong tool. That will be our other one. Okay, so the second cylindrical forms. So cylindrical, I'm just talking about a cylinder. We all remember this shape from kindergarten. We got to put the round peg in the round hole and the square peg in the square hole. The round peg is called a cylinder. And if we've got a square peg, we can call that a prism. And if you're like, well, wait, it wasn't a triangle thing, a prism? Like, yes, it is a prism too. So these are all shapes that have kind of long rectangular bodies. And if we see them straight on from like straight up top, this is all we're going to see. Right? So if we have this thing uh, rotated, for example, along this pivot point, right? We're going to have one that comes up like this. And let's say one that comes up like this. Right? This is be how this would be how it stands up. How does that look in three dimensions? Well, it's going to look a lot the same 
this one's going to look a lot the same, right? Because if we're looking at this, if if we're looking at this cylinder kind of standing up from uh, from our from our point of view straight on, and then from our point of view up here, this shape isn't going to be any different. However, this one is kind of standing is kind of standing up. So we're going to see if it's a cylinder. We're going to see an ellipse or a or a circular shape on one side and then we're going to see it end on the other. So like when it's laying flat against the ground, it's going to look like a rectangle, and when it's kind of leaning up towards us, it will become elliptical. Until it reaches the point where it's standing straight up, and when it's standing straight up, we can't see the sides anymore, and that rectangular form has become, to our eyes, a circle. Right? Fairly straightforward. Any questions about that? Does that seem pretty straightforward? Are you completely lost, is the other question. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Okay. If anyone's completely lost, I don't I don't blame you. Um we'll we will kind of no, that's fine. We will we will kind of move on. If this didn't work, that's why I've got five of these things, right? I've got overlapping in size, that's one thing. I've got this. When a cylinder stands up, it becomes more elliptical until it becomes a perfect circle because we're staring at it from the top down. So cylindrical forms become circular, and prismatic forms just adopt whatever shape they have on their end, right? So if this square prism is lying down, we see a rectangle, and as it stands up more, it's just going to become more and more square-like. So when it first starts standing up, we're going to see just like a little bit of a square, and then a bit more until it becomes a square, right? Pretty simple, the same for the triangle. So now, when we're looking at a muzzle, a muzzle can be described roughly as a cylindrical shape. So like, it's kind of, it's kind of an elliptical cylinder, but, you know, nevertheless, we've got those parts that we covered earlier, right? It's going to be the nose, it's going to be the upper lip, it's going to be the lower lip. But roughly we can think of it as this cylinder if we're looking at it from straight on, whereas if we're looking at it from the side or from an angle, we're going to see more of an angle. And that's why I've covered this one. So cylindrical forms become circular and the prismatic form, you can also think of you can also think of it as a prismatic form. I mean, if uh, if you if you prefer a more angular approach, so say we've got this kind of hexagonal prism, right? So he's got multiple sides to it, let's say, and then this one is going to be it's it's going to have the same features. It's just going to be a little bit more uh, angular as opposed to round and smooth and so forth. So it's not, so as you can see this, this shape on the end is kind of flat. Well that's because it's not exactly a cylinder, it's more of a, what's called a tapering cylinder. And that just means a cylinder that gets bigger or smaller in one direction. Right? So if we're looking at a cone, a cone is a cylinder that tapers. It starts big at this end and gets smaller as we move that direction. Same is true for muzzles in a, in kind of a in less in less intense a shape as the cone. Kind of resembles maybe more of a lampshade. So we've got a nose, 
and then this tapering form goes back. And this will be where um, I point back to where we saw overlapping in size. Overlapping in size is not going to uh, happen as much with a real muzzle because it slopes down like this. It's actually the smaller form that's in front and it gets bigger as it recedes. So that's why when you're looking at a dog straight on, the muzzle can seem kind of, you know, flat and one-dimensional, and then it just kind of pops out as it rotates to one side or another. So there we go. That's that. I'll move this over here. And again, I'm going to take this entire thing and just kind of tuck it up smaller. And this will be two. All right. The third foreshortening and perspective uh, technique I'm going to kind of show, uh, I call it compression of contours and revealing new contours. Um, this one's kind of... This one takes kind of some visual muscle to begin with, but let's start out let's start out really simple, right? So say I'm going to horror of horrors, I'm taking you back to math class for just a moment and I'm going to show you a grid. Right? Everybody remembers high school geometry. If you don't if you haven't taken high school geometry, good luck. Uh it's not that complicated. But we've got a grid and so we've got what's called an x-axis and the y-axis. If you haven't learned this yet, you will one day. So you'll get it. And then if we are including a third dimension, there's also a, a z-axis. Any of you get into 3D modeling, you'll become very familiar with these terms. So, so all right, we have to think about uh, contours in space, so to, so to speak. And to help do that, uh, I'm going to... So we're going to... We're going to um, let's see here. Yeah, we're still good. All right, so say that we're drawing a circle along the x-y axis. And this is just kind of straight. So this is just going to be a circle along the x-y axis. And I'm going to actually, sorry, let me redo this real quick. I'm going to redo this. I'm going to redo this because this will get confusing too fast unless I differentiate. OK. This will be our x-axis. This will be our y-axis. And this will be our z-axis. And in 3D modeling, these all meet at a place called the, called the origin. And again, don't get terribly um, overwhelmed by this. It's just it's just a thing. So let's say that we're drawing drawing one around the origin is just going to be a circle except it is a circle that pertains to this line only and we're going to do the same for the other ones so then for this one the circle is going to overlap with this one and it's going to kind of widen it's still a circle, it's just a circle in perspective. Constrained to the x-axis here. And then we'll do one to the green as well. And let's say that this one, this one's going to be just a little bit more stretched, but it's going to come out here and back in here.
So we've got these three circles along each of our axes, which is plural for axis. I hope I'm not losing too many of you. If I am, it's okay. This this one is more of the is one of the more complex ones, but like with study and practice, anything can be learned. So we've got a bunch of outlines along uh, our latitude uh, and our equator, so to speak, if we imagine this as a, as a globe. But yeah, so um, it, starts, it starts out as a globe. How does this relate to furry heads? Coming back to that. So along this red axis, we're going to have contours, all right? And let me let me place these here just kind of for reference. These will be the eyes of our character. Right? And so if this is a head and we've got eyes right here, the nose is going to come out come out along the z-axis. And if we constrain the red lines, we're going to see multiple contours for the face and the muzzle. So the contours are going to look something like this, if it's just a pure wireframe. And they'll kind of get bigger as they get now these are all the the red axis ones because they go along that uh, that plane and then a blue one say would come out this way and then it would kind of curve out and along the front and then back again and this is a rather goofy looking thing I hope you can bear with me here and then along the green axis, it's all these lines. So this one will come straight. This one. And so each of these, if you can kind of turn off the other two for a sec, we can imagine that these are just 2D objects arranged in a three-dimensional grid, right? I could try, kind of draw a grid along here, along here, and we can kind of understand the muzzle that way. Let me do some more blues here, because we can do that as well. These will be constrained along here. And again, if it's just a wireframe, this is going to come around the entire head. Is anyone's brains hurting? <laughs> a bit, yeah. I, I totally understand. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry for inflicting this pain upon you. I really am sorry for inflicting this pain. But that pain is hopefully you developing some some sense of uh, contours in three dimensions, right? Because the contours of a thing just go along along the outside. It's a very outside tracing. <laughs> No, 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 maths are beautiful. Maths should not have been banned in the Geneva Convention. <laughs> They're beautiful. All right, I took you through the hard stuff. Let me switch to some easy stuff. Let me switch to some easy stuff. Hang on just a second.
that working? You guys can still hear me, right? Okay, good. Alright, so I switched over to my 3D program here. Uh, it's very similar to ZBrush. It's a ZBrush sketchbook. Basically, this is a free program called Sculptress Alpha 6. And what I've done is I've gone ahead and I've modeled a kind of a canine head with a muzzle, as you can see. And as I rotate this model, we can see kind of these principles in action. And we don't have to use our visual imagination so hard because the computer is making this model for us. But we can kind of see, I hope that you can see anyways, there's a little bit of a symmetry line going down the center here. And so this again, it aligns with our Y axis. And all of this information is being processed by uh, by a computer right now. And it's not going to be... I could turn on the wireframe, but the wireframe is just a bunch of triangles. But if we return to the idea of just having these X, Y, and Z axes, the computer is rendering all of them at once. And it brings like... and it says like, oh, okay, now we have something that looks like a surface. And the more we turn it to the side, we see a profile inside and the muzzle sticks out and the more we turn it forward the muzzle kind of flattens Sculptress is using kind of a fake shadowing technique to apply shading to the underside but it helps us understand this form in the in the absence of true lighting so in this one the contour the the traced outline of the shape is perfectly round right because this just started off as a sphere plain sphere i just molded it so that it has a muzzle does that visualization that's a bit easier does that help okay again if you've got digital stuff uh, this this is a, a free program. It's very nifty. If you've got a um, if you've got a, a, a tablet kind of setup, I've got my uh, Cintiq monitor here. It's a very neat kind of funny modeling program, and it's great for doing uh, just quick sketches of features. This, these are not going to be anything like super detailed models. And if you have uh, let's see here, and if you have ZBrush, it'll export straight into ZBrush, super easy. I don't own ZBrush. I just have this, but it suits the purposes for like, oh, I don't want to think about this super hard. Let me just pull out my 3D reference. And so I've got one right here. And so I can do other things in this program, like rotate it side to side. You know, right now it's just kind of locked in this one area. I can turn off, I can turn on a free camera, for instance, and then I can start it can start kind of wobbling a little bit more freely and I can get some maybe more interesting angles on it than I could when the camera was kind of locked in position. So that's a way to do it um, in, in a 3D program. Uh, if you're not, if you're like, oh, I, I'm not fancy and I don't have anything like this, uh, you can pull out a ball of clay. Clay is super cheap. You can buy it at, you know, any... Uh, arts and crafts store for like less than a dollar I think some of these things per pound even sometimes um, tell me if I'm wrong on that but like you can get clay for relatively cheap and then you can do this yourself you can make a mold of this of this head and actually I, I encourage doing that um, if you've got if you've got digital tools I suggest getting sculptures alpha 6 to kind of like Oh, understand what it's like to play with the form. What it's like to kind of build shapes out, for instance. Say I wanted to build some ears on this guy. I can do that. I've got kind of like a starting of some ear shape right now. 
Kind of looks more like a bear than a canine. But, you know, still, it's a muzzle. Great, huh? Okay. And now it's just going to stare at you with those empty eye sockets. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to switch away from this back to Clip Studio Paint. Just a second, guys. Uh, bears are ursine. They're in their own family. Bears are not canine. They are ursines. I haven't switched back in Discord yet. Just hang on. Alright, cool. Uh, I hope that was a cool kind of visualization. I encourage you to do something like that on your own time. So, um, why do I call it the compression of contours? Because when I rotate this thing through space, these lines, the wireframes, are going to appear closer and closer and closer, right? Until they flatten out, just like our prism does. You know, it, it appears kind of 3D as it, as it tilts towards us, but it returns to kind of a, a 2D looking thing again. It goes from looking like a rectangle to looking like a circle. And then we know it's not both, it's a cylinder. It's a three-dimensional object. And kind of the same thing with, the, with muzzles and snouts here. So I hope that helps. I hope it didn't confuse too much. Uh, meditate on it all you want. You have all the time in the world to learn this. There is no test. But I will ask about it next week. <laughs> Bad joke. Alright, so that's number three. Uh, excuse me. Compression of contours and revealing new contours. Yes, and it reveals new contours because um, the the shape of the entire contour of the head changes, right? When it's out like this, it's got this muzzle jutting out. When the muzzle is facing straight forward to us, it appears more like a circle. So that's compression of contours and the revealing of new contours. All right. Now... We get to use another tool called pivots and ellipses. And so what we're going to uh, imagine here is that like back in the 3D program, uh, the entire head had a pivot point, right? I could rotate it from left to right and it was kind of locked around an axis like in this number three back here. Um, whenever we are trying to rotate a head. Let me see if I can draw kind of a quick three-quarters head here. Right. And now I'm going to pull out some of my special tools. Uh, actually, I'm going to create it on this layer because it will need to be particular. All right, so um, say that I'm rotating this form along an axis kind of embedded in its head right there. It comes in this way, goes out this way. Don't think about it too hard. It's not an impaled head. It's just an imaginary construct. <laughs> Uh, all right, so if we've got it along that point, we can use, I'm using a special ruler here uh, called the concentric circle guide. And what it's going to do is it's going to create an elliptical shape. Oh, 
for us to uh, actually nope nope that's the axis it's right there gonna be super simple maybe tilt it just a little because it wasn't along that way oh this is not gonna be in three dimensions <laughs> Let's hope the idea kind of carries out. So what this tool allows me to do is it allows me to make these concentric circle shapes. <sighs> yeah, that doesn't work. Okay, I'm going to have to freehand this because my special ruler isn't actually helping me in this scenario. Alright. So we imagine... That I've got kind of these these parallel concentric circles, right? This is kind of an imaginary exercise. We've got this axis through the head. If we rotated it, this nose would go along this uh, orbit, so to speak, right? But the height of it would not change because we're rotating it around one point. It would always be around here. The eyes would always be around this orbit. The bottom would always be around its own orbit. Right? So if we're imagining the head this way, if we've just kind of drawn it this way, and we have kind of a a sketch idea of like, oh, what if I rotated it, you know, entirely to the side here? Then we've got kind of an idea. The nose would be right here, right? And then since it would be in profile, we'd only see one eye. Let me do this in a different color. So we've got kind of a nose here, and the eye would be here, right? And our bottom lip aligned right there. So it would be there. And then we can see, like, oh, uh, and, and of course this works, like, kind of forwards and backwards. I'm doing it kind of backwards here. But we've got this idea of the head and snout. And this is, this is not perfect by any means, but I hope the idea is translating. Yeah, a half pound of clay for 10 bucks. If you need a model, it's pretty easy to get. But, yeah. Does um, does what I've covered there, the, the uh, pivot... So the pivot point is this axis right here. And the ellipses are kind of our imaginary orbit guidelines that uh, help us to imagine uh, where in space these, this nose would go out to. Um were we to put it, were we to rotate it uh, this way or that way. Say if we wanted to rotate it backwards, this might work a little bit better. So let's say we've got the back of the head. Again, I'll switch colors to do this. So we're going to do a back of the head where we're not even going to see the eyes, right? But we will still see the muzzle because we've got the nose is going to come out along here and back here. <laughs> Are you completely lost again? <laughs> I said this was for beginners. Did I lie? Okay. Yeah, again, this is kind of like it's it's beginner in the sense that like I need to you need to be introduced to this topic. Um, because, like, it will help exercise, like I said, your imaginative uh, muscles in your head. It will help you kind of build the 3D modeler in your head.
Any more comments? I'm running kind of short on time. But this one, this last one's actually fairly easy in comparison to everything that's come before. So that's a, that's a pivot and ellipse kind of method. We kind of imagine that these are perfect ellipses that will help guide where exactly things are going to go when we pivot them around a point. So again, imaginary exercise. Can move that here and label that an example of four. Five, linear projection. This one's going to be a lot easier, actually. So I have my weird special rulers here. I didn't need that one. Uh, but I have a special ruler right here uh, that is a parallel line ruler. And what it allows me to do is create perfectly parallel lines. How is this useful in foreshortening? I will tell you. So let me for a moment turn uh, the snaps to special ruler off, right? Okay, so say again, we are going to, it's, it's too hard to draw something rotated the first time. So we're going to draw it straight on. Uh, this, is, this is again another profile shot, another mug shot, so to speak, right here. We've got a nose right here. We've got eyes right here, roughly. We got a mouth drooping down right here and right here. And it comes back and maybe there's a chin and maybe so it's not dead. Play some little pupils there and go like, oh no, what's this guy about to do to me? All right. So, say I've got this right here. It's straight up, right? This is not necessarily an exciting angle, but we can kind of work with it. And it works on a similar principle as the pivots and ellipses, except it's simpler because we're just drawing straight lines, projections, from one place to another, right? I've got the top of the skull here, bottom of the skull here. I've got a top of the ear that aligns along here bottom aligns along roughly here, nose goes along roughly here, top of the eye goes along roughly here, and so forth, right? Drawing a bunch of these kind of guidelines. Because if we rotate it around this, this kind of central axis again, everything right here is, is not going to change its position uh, uh, vertically. It will only change horizontally. So we can come back to that and kind of imagine, okay, well, we know that the head starts up there, goes there. But this is still kind of circular in shape. And so we've got a nose. Oh, uh, maybe it's going to come out this far. They got a cop top of the muzzle. Again, about this right, right there. And again, we got a bottom lip. I don't have a guideline for that, but I can see it's just kind of like right above this ear line. So I'm going to go right here. And the eyes, again, going to be right here, but we're only going to see this one. And the ears, we got guidelines for that. Along there. And we got a bottom of the chin right about there. And we'll say it goes up there. And we got some little cheekbone thingies, maybe. Maybe this head slopes back a little. Maybe it's not a perfect circle, because, like, few things rarely are. Yeah, uh, is this something that, that makes more sense? Maybe a little bit easier than the elliptical ones? I'm not seeing anything. Oh, okay. 
maybe there's a bit of a delay. Again, I don't want, you know, one person to speak for everybody. Like, if you're confused, it's important to ask questions. You know, this is supposed to be a group study, not just, like, I'm teaching you how to foreshorten. Like, definitely participation's encouraged. I'm not going to expect it right off the bat, but I want you guys to know you're always welcome to participate. Always. So if you don't, and if you don't get something, feel free to ask questions. If you're embarrassed to ask them now, ask them to me later. Uh, my PMs are open. DMs are open. Whatever you call them. <laughs> oh yeah, I should say that I'm getting it. But this linear projection, you know, like, it, it doesn't work for just drawing profile faces, right? We can kind of help imagine a three-quarters face in this, too. So say I turn on my rulers again, and I just kind of continue these. It's not perfect, but it's close enough. Stop it. I got pop-ups. They're helpful pop-ups, but they're still pop-ups. All right, and then we've got, let's say we got a nose right here. We're gonna have the top of the eye right here, and another eye's gonna be right here, maybe. Again, this kind of slopes up. That's linear projection. Um, all right. Uh, if you have any leftover questions, did I did I address the the question that uh someone had earlier? Hang on, it's coming up. Okay, good. Good, good, good. Yeah. Um so I hope that uh I hope that one of these or one or more of these comes in handy. I know a couple of them were were quite brain stretching and uh that's good for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to repeat that joke. <laughs> but it's a good one. <laughs> Guys, stop. <laughs> for the sake of our YouTube v viewers, the joke is, in BDSM, the M stands for math, and the S stands for some more math. All right, I think I'm gonna wrap this up. If any, no, serious, does anyone else have any other questions? You don't, and thank you. Oh well, thank you again for coming. I hope it's been a good learning experience, even though things are a bit difficult sometimes, a bit brain-bending. 
You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Again, you guys are warming my heart. I'm super thankful to be able to help people out a little bit. Maybe you don't get everything, but, you know, maybe there's something that latched on that can that can help you. And maybe you can pass that on to someone else, is my hope. Linear algebra, linear transformations are a massive oof. Yes, they definitely are. Oh, you're welcome. I'm happy. I'm happy to do this. Yeah, this is a surprisingly difficult topic, and it's a question that comes up all the time in this server. How to draw the muzzle. Drawing the muzzle, again, to kind of um, summarize and encapsulate things, drawing the muzzle is a foreshortening problem. Uh, it's, an, it's an anatomy problem. Uh, these are things that aren't necessarily easy to pick up. But once you do, they're powerful, powerful tools. Yeah, a ge geometrical, geometrical problem. <laughs> it's a thinking in three dimensions problem. It's, it's creative problem solving. Anyway, I hope I gave you some tools um, to our YouTube viewers. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to wrap this stream up. I'm a couple minutes over. Uh, have a great day. Again, thank you everyone sh for showing up so much. Um, we'll do this again next week. I don't know what I'll be covering. I have to revisit the list that I wrote once upon a time. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye.